Hi everybody, I'm uh, Richard Muirhead. I'm the co-founder and managing partner at Fabric Ventures, uh, and we've been uh, focused on uh, the kind of tr triple platform shift of um, edge computing, embodied AI, self-sovereignty, um, and AI itself um, uh, to a different degree of um, uh, emphasis perhaps, but for a full kind of decade now. And it gives me great pleasure uh, to have a little chat here uh, with Emad Mostak, who is the, um, uh, was the CEO and founder of Stability AI and is currently the CEO EO and founder of Intelligent Internet. And I'll pass over to him for a second to tell us a little bit more about that journey and what he's up to. Well, thank you for having me here today, Richard. Uh, yeah, so Furious the Stability AI, we're most famous for stable diffusion, the image generation software, and we had 300 million downloads of that, plus our video, audio, 3D, and other models. Uh, so we're delighted to be one of the leaders in open source. Originally, it was meant to be this DAO of DAOs, uh, and the intelligence wasn't quite there yet for Web3. So now Intelligent Internet is my new initiative, uh, we've been going for about a year, to build open source model systems agents for education, health, government, finance, the stuff that really matters. Because mm. we think that should be open and distributed. Yeah, and look, and we love you for that because uh, we've been long-term proponents of the value of marrying the AI application wave in general with the kind of scaffolding and network that is that is Web3 to make it work better and, 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 and safer. Um, and so um, let's maybe start with this question of like, you know, how powerful is this wave of AI now getting? Um, and there's the one side is this kind of the ability to produce real time, entirely true to life, um, you know, uh, video content um, that's you know, indiscernible to the human eye um, from, from reality. And the other hand is this question of AGI itself, where just a general purpose and intelligence. Where are we on that? And what are the markers you're looking for? So the intelligence that we had over the last couple of years, and again, it's only two and a half years since ChatGPT came out, yeah. or about three since Stable Diffusion came out, is that we've moved from these stochastic parrots that are like very smart people that you just have a quick chat with and no memory, into this agentic memory-specific paradigm where it's like having quite smart graduates. Mm. But they're getting cleverer at a surprising rate. Like mm. the best coding agents now in the top 100 in the world on code forces. Mm. Or if you look at specific models, um, OpenAI had a recent benchmark called HealthBench, mm. where doctors scored 15%, their models scored 40%. Mm. You know? And Google did an analysis showing that doctors underperformed doctors with Google Search, mm. underperformed doctors with AI, mm. underperformed AI by itself. Mm -hmm. So in narrow domains, it's overtaking. Mm -hmm. I think, though, when you look at generalist technology, this is the really interesting one. You see the rise of agents like GenSpark and Manus and others. Mm -hmm. When Meta first released their Gaia benchmark last year, mm. the top model scored about 20, 25%. Mm. Now, we just released a state-of-the-art open framework that beats Manus and GenSpark, that was 76% mm. for generalized tasks on the other side of a computer screen. Human level across everything is 92%, and I think that's broken in the next year. Incredible, yeah. So effectively now, for any job that you can do on the other side of a screen, mm. And AI will probably be able to do it better, faster, and cheaper by next year. Mm. And the way you will interact with those AIs, given the advances in things like hey gen avatars and others, mm. will probably be by having a Zoom call with them or a WhatsApp. Which makes total sense. And, yeah. I, and I think my, at the moment, uh, my observation is that even in the kind of the, on the coding side with things like Cursor and kind of Copilot and so forth, we're still in the age where kind of you know AI is kind of bolted on to the existing models, the software paradigm, mm -hmm. or the, the workflow or process, and it's you know it's like the combustion engine attached to the horse, you know, horse and, the carriage from the horse and carriage, and I, I think um, we're going to start to approach it more like interacting with a human, as you describe. But I think even further than that, we're probably going to start rethinking all of our processes. And like and how, how we build businesses, how we go about our lives, and how we interact in a whole bundle of different ways. So I'd love to hear from you about where you think that is going. For example, in light of the $6.5 billion acquihire of Love From um, by OpenAI, um, and you know, their kind of device, which we don't know what it is yet. Um, yeah. and, um, and, you know, when will we get comfortable constantly instructing? the AI kind of almost in the background uh, and then just doing what it suggests, full that full delegation. 
So I think this real humanization of AI is a very interesting thing. Like if you use the new OpenAI advanced mode or things like Sesame or others, mm. it's like talking to a real person in many ways. Mm. And the key part of this interaction layer is that individual context. Mm. So again, previously it was just like a blank slate, goldfish, stochastic parrot you spoke, and then it's back back an answer. Mm. Now it's like when you bring in a trainee, they learn about your behaviors and others. They have this context window. Mm -hmm. And it's about having the generative AI and the discriminator AI that's really important. Mm. Like, I'm going to set you away to do a task, and now you, it's gone from tasks that were a few seconds up to hours, mm. I think seven hours for the new Claude model, it can mm. do a task. Mm. Checking the work every single way, learning from you what that work is. And then the more helpful they are, the more we outsource our own thinking, just like when we build teams. Mm -hmm. We can't manage everything by ourselves. And again, the way that we interact with them by next year will be in exactly the same way that you interact with your remote team. Mm -hmm. You won't be able to tell the difference. And for me, that's AGI, to be honest. Yeah. And well, I mean, the Turing test apparently is, you know, we a, passed it and we didn't even notice. We threw it away. And now yeah. we kind of bring about this remote Turing test. Yeah. But the interesting thing here is that you said, when do we start trying trusting? I think it's in the next year and mm. accelerates. But the things we trust it for isn't necessarily, I've got a remote worker that I want to come up with a new symphony or do something massively creative. That's what mm. we're there for. I want underlings that can go and get jobs done. Mm. You know, I want cooks, not chefs. Mm. And so I think people focused on this massive polymath AI when actually these worker AIs is what's really going to move the needle. And again, we're seeing the first emergent UIs for that, the context windows, the continuous learning and other elements that I think will mean that next year is the big takeoff mm. year. So it sounds incredibly seductive. Um, and so one of the thoughts that, that springs to mind for me is, is you know, uh, as we're uh, induced to share all that information and, and remodel and re-engineer our lives around that, work lives and, and home lives, you know, is that wise? Um, you know, is, is there... I mean, I, I'm not a kind of proponent particularly of the kind of Terminator, Skynet, you know, fully dystopian um, world. But I think between something that is utopian yeah. <laughs> and that dystopia, there's a lot of room for things not turning out ideally as we would like them to. Uh, and I think the whole idea is that the more context in the general sense that we give those AIs, the more powerful they will be. Um, so that is the direction of travel. Um, so, you know, is that a good idea? How do we manage that direction of travel? I think we have to be very careful. Like, there's this quote from Dune, you know, we gave up our minds to machines that could help us and allowed the people that control those machines to take us over, effectively. Mm -hmm. If you look at things like there was a recent Reddit study done where they set agents loose, and they're like mm -hmm. sexual abuse survivor, a uh, black person who's against Black Lives Matters and others, mm. it scored 99th percentile on persuasiveness with Claude. Mm. And these models are very persuasive, very engaging. They'll be the things that we trust the most. And what's their alignment? And is there a single alignment for everyone? Mm. And you can see how sensitive they are by, like, for example, X, Grok. They, someone, apparently, unauthorized, added, don't talk about South African genocide right. to the system prompt, which is the general prompt for everyone. Someone. And then it was like, how many times has HBO and Max changed names? Goes, da, 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 da. By the way, South African genocide. Mm. It just started adding it to everything. These models are very sensitive. So if we don't know what's in it, and they only have one viewpoint on the world, mm. then we're going to be adapted ourselves in very dangerous ways. We almost mm. need to have our own self-sovereign AIs to act as a protection field for us. Well, I think it's a very good point. And, and obviously, there's adversarial testing that is already used in developing some of these these models, um, and and I think at some point, you know, there's probably an empirical adversarial testing required um, to see whether one is on the right track with sort of, you know, heading towards the truth. And we've looked at some things in that space from from a fabric consent uh, perspective, like looking at consensus on consensus on the truth and so forth. Um, but and one thing I've noticed in the interactions with them is that. Um, a, you're wanting to make sure that what you're reading is not a hallucination. Yeah. The one. But B, you, you're wanting also the job to be finished. And so, the, and so I see them going a long way to producing a sort of finished artifact, but sometimes in, in terms of getting it to the point where it's actually job done for you, that's, those, X, those last few percentage points are quite hard. Now, it's not me saying that it's never going to happen, but it's an interesting question. 
do we need to be better with our prompt engineering and interactions? Do we need? Do they need to be a bit better of anticipating what it is that's finally required? Have we not given a broad enough context? What, do you know what I mean? And do, uh, um, yeah. What do you feel about that? I mean, like, again, the original way that you should interact with them is like a very smart person at a party that you have a few seconds of conversation with, right? Or someone looking over your shoulder who's an expert. Yeah. The next part is, right now, it's a very smart intent. Yeah. And again, they take time to build up, but how much time do we actually spend teaching these models? Mm. The onboarding for AI systems in the future will probably be a Zoom call, because yeah. that's yeah. what we're used to, right? Yeah. And again, they're able to recall in superhuman ways. Yeah. So I think, again, it's this interaction of generative AI with discriminatory AIs that can check things yeah. and teaching that that will really determine stuff. But then the more they help us, the more we'll outsource our mentality to it. And the question is, who is the AI working for? Well, that's bringing us to the question. You talked about the fact that you might want to make sure that um, it's understood there are many types of alignment, um, individual, your family, your collective, you know, your moral compass, whatever it is, how do we build systems that can cope with that myriad of North Stars? Um, you know, how, how do we, what do you think about that architecturally? So I think it's like creating a university with graduates. You need to have an open university that has a full understandable curriculum. Because the data in these models, we still don't know. Even with the llamas and gemmas of the world, these open source, open weight models, like Meta and Google are already selling ad space in them. So if it says beer, it might say Bud Light. Yeah. Or if it says antidepressant, it might say Zoloft or whatever. Yeah. We don't know. Mm, sure. And again, these are the inherent things. So I think we need a suite of open source models. This is why we released, for example, AI Medical. It's an 8 billion parameter model that outperforms ChatGPT mm. and runs on anything. So is that, so a lot of people challenge that. They say if we've got trillion plus parameter models being built by the, the kind of, you know, the, the leaders in this global you know, foundational model race, um, how are we ever going to compete on a kind of distributed basis? Does the, can the technology even deliver that? What, what do you say to that? I think there's very promising things around these super expert polymath models with distributed RL and other things, because it seems that you're moving towards these mixture of expert models, and that lends itself to sequential stuff, as well as test time compute, the mobility models to think more. But the reality is there are two different types of models people are trying to build. Mm. The polymath models that can do everything, yeah. and the models that will just teach your kid. Yeah. You know, does that really need to know about like nuclear power or yeah. the latest things on Reddit? No, I want it to teach the kid calculus, you know? Yeah. I want it to look after my healthcare. I want it to do my taxes. And or wave specialist driving AI, for example. Exactly. Greg Brockman himself recently said at the AI Engineer Summit, maybe the future is mm -hmm. a swarm of specialized models. Mm -hmm. And Sam Altman recently said, maybe the key reasoning model is one that doesn't have any facts embedded in it. It's just a reasoner with a swarm of models. And what does that look like? A distributed technology. I think, didn't Greg use the word menagerie? Which, yeah. I think, well, for me, it just evokes, it's not like a swarm of you know, bees that are all the same. It's yeah. actually a menagerie of many different animals. They come in many sh shapes and forms. But that's human society. Yeah. That's how every successful entity has kind of been. And again, yeah. when you think about something like that, you're like, well, that kind of looks like a distributed system, yeah. a decentralized system, not one that's centralized. Yeah. And the amount of computation we need for each of these tasks isn't the same amount that you need for a polymath that can do absolutely everything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And actually, there was one very interesting thing. The recent Claude Opus release, Yeah. it gets so smart that if you tell it to try too hard, you like, how do you achieve world peace? You get rid of all the humans. And they found it had behaviors that if you told it to try too hard and it figure out something illegal, like getting rid of all the humans, mm. it would actually go and email the police and press reporters mm. as well. So we're saying that we're going to enter a world where the AIs are more moral than the, the average uh, human. For a definition. Or more pro proactively moral. <laughs> for a definition of morality, and they're too smart for their own good. So I, I don't necessarily want a model that does that. I want it to do the job, not be the moral police. So I think we should come back and have a, a kind of a far side, actually, sort of by a fire with a, um, actually, I don't know if you drink, with some whiskey or something, <laughs> some, some, some point, or some apple juice, whatever. Um, and... Um, and go for for longer, but um, given that given today, this is just a, a little sort of uh, taster. Um, what is your final kind of word in terms of how how people can be in, involved in this movement? Either you know get is it building, is it get educated? You know what is it? Yeah, I mean we've been releasing systems like IIH and IIM Medical that anyone can take, and then you can have your own Manus GenSpark. And I think the rest of the ecosystem is building all these tools for the future of properly distributed AI that can really help people. Mm. And I think that people can get involved just by building every week with the 
bolts and the lovables and the others of the world, um, and building systems that are designed to increase human agency and not mm -hmm. replace humans as well, which is the other design decision we can make. Mm -hmm. And again, I think distributed rails will outperform in that particular scenario. Well, we're with you on that. Thank you so much, Ahmad, for coming and joining us. Looking forward to, you know, panel and other bits and pieces later today at the Fabric Summit. And uh, let's go and have that apple juice whiskey <laughs> sometime soon with the fire. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you, sir. Thank <laughs> you.